Can we give one more round of applause for Stan and Tom? They'll be doing an awesome job. My goodness. Absolutely amazing. Well, good morning, church. Hello again. There are more of you now. This is good. Well, hey, um, I want to take just a moment to pray, and then we're going to dive into God's Word. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much that we can be here today. Uh, God, I pray for all the families that are here and are with us. God, I pray that they had a wonderful holiday. And Lord God, I pray that they have a tremendous 2020 to come. And God, with those things in perspective, I pray that as we go into your word, Lord, that that you'll bless us with your word, that it will cut to our hearts. Uh, God, I pray that you will diminish me um, as I wish you diminish every preacher in the pulpit. And that God, your word be lifted up. God, that your spirit be in the room. God, that your spirit be moving on hearts, that your spirit be renewing minds. God, I pray that there will be ears to hear in this room today. God, I pray that seeds that are cast from your word, Lord, won't land on uh, thorns and thistles or on hard ground, but rather, Lord, they'll land in the fertile soil. And God, that there'll be water and there'll be planting, but God, you'll give all the growth. And so, Lord, we pray that for every single person in this room today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, normally the holiday time is a very upbeat time, uh, and if you know me at all, you know I'm a pretty upbeat guy. I like to be positive. Um, I like to uh, keep things up, and I got a little bit of energy. Dave always calls me Tigger, which I don't really like, but that's okay, because he's always bouncing around everywhere. But today, uh, we're going to have a little bit more somber of a message. Um, for many of you, I don't know everyone's story, but sometimes for many, the holidays are kind of a hard time. Uh, It's not always a super happy time for everybody. A lot of people lose family during the holiday time. Uh, A lot of people get into fights with their family during holiday time. Some people face work pressure during holiday time, and they're not able to be with the people they want to be in. Uh, Raise your hand if sometimes the holidays can be difficult for you, or they've been difficult at least once in your life. A lot of people, right? A lot of people. So today, we're going to do a message uh, kind of about facing trouble when it comes and what to do, how to handle it, how to endure it, how to prepare for it. And so if you will, I want you to open up in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 23. And if you don't want to open up in the Bible, you can just open up your bulletin, and I wrote it there for you, so you already have it. So you can go either one. So if you want the difficulty of finding the page, you can do that. Or if you want to open up the bulletin, that is fine as well. And we're going to be in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, verses 11 and 12, only 11 and 12. And we're going to be looking at one of the mighty men of David, and we're going to be trying to draw a few observations from him and the way he handled the situation, and then also look at what the New Testament tells us about how to endure a trial or an adversity when it comes, and even potentially to trust God to take that adversity or to take that difficult situation, to take that hopeless moment and perhaps even redeem it. And make it into one of the greatest moments of your life when you look back at how the Lord's able to shape you. uh, After seeing how the Lord's able to mold you. After seeing how the Lord is able to help you persevere. And for some, these dark times, they they can last more than a day or a season or a holiday. They can last for years. But the Lord will prevail. He is faithful. And you can trust Him with that. And so we're going to see what this man, this mighty man of David, Shema, did one day. It says this, 2 Samuel 23, verses 11 to 12. After him, the other mighty men, two of them, after him was Shema, son of Aji, the Herite. The Philistines had assembled in formation where there was a field full of lentils. The troops fled from the Philistines, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it, and he struck down the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory brought about a great victory. Church, I I want you to know this. God can work through any situation. He can prevail through any situation. And as hard as this to understand, even the difficult situations that we have in our lives, and Lord knows some of the things I hear, even from some of the students, seem like the hardest things. I don't think I could endure them. And yet, God allows those situations. But God does not just allow those situations without giving you an opportunity, an option for hope. And that hope doesn't come from within. That, that hope doesn't, doesn't come from your strength of your back or, or the soundness of your mind or the cunning that you may have. But rather, the hope that we have comes from Christ. 
And the Holy Spirit, the one who he's given to us, is the one that can deliver us from the most difficult situations. And it's so too what we're going to find with Shema today, as maybe tough and, 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 and strong of a man he was, a mighty man he was, he was not mighty apart from God. He was not powerful apart from God. And that is the same story for us when we endure hardships. And so I want, I want you to take a few notes as you take notes from the board. It says this, the first, the first point is this, identify what is worth defending. Identify what is worth defending. If you want to live a victorious life in Christ, one of the first things to do is identify what is worth defending. Now know this, we can't identify what's worth defending on our own, but rather we should trust God on those things. Raise your hand if you've ever defended something that was not worth defending. Even something silly like an argument, yeah? I know I had one of these the other night. Uh, my wife and myself and a friend, we were playing a game called Quelf. Anyone ever play Quelf? Wow, okay, we're losers. All right, so like, only, like no one here that's, that's ever played. Well, Quelf is a game where uh, it's, just, it's just a silly board game. And I was getting upset because I felt like I was being treated wrongly. And so I'm making a big deal out of this because I had to move back two little spaces. And then afterwards, I'm talking to my wife and I'm like, what's the matter with me? Like, why do, why do I care about this? Why am I choosing to fight this fight? The truth is, guys, a lot of times the hardships we face are very tiny and they're middle school and they're not significant. And you want to seek out the important ones and you want to prepare ahead of time for those. So tonight we're not talking about the little tiny things that get us upset or agitated. Instead, what we're talking about is we're talking about the big things that come in life and to be proactive with them and to prepare for them. And so in identifying them, there's, there's three key ways to do so that Scripture reveals to us. Number one is obviously prayer, seeking after God. If you are not someone that prays, if you are not someone that prays to God, if you are not one who seeks the face of the Lord, you are in trouble. You are in trouble. If you want to be able to identify what's worth defending in your life, where you need to set up defenses because Satan is going to scheme to come into those areas, then you need to be a person of prayer and seek after God and ask him to help you put up these defenses in certain areas. It says in James 1.5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without approach and it will be given to them. Guys, if you are going to be going through difficult times, you must seek God in prayer. Ask him where you need to build up those defenses, wherever they might be. And the truth is, the more time you spend with God, the more you become like him. The more you begin to display some of his wisdom because the Holy Spirit renews your mind. The truth is, the more you spend time with someone, the more you a little bit become like them. We're that way as humans. We're a little bit malleable. I'll give you an example. I've been married now for four years, and I have learned how to match my clothes. I've learned how to do that. I know colors. And on top of that, I, yeah, yeah, give it up. Give it up. Even more importantly, that applause is for Carolina, by the way. The other thing by proximity to Carolina that I've learned is also what the appropriate clothes are for the occasion, because that is also something I struggle with. Otherwise, I'd be up here in board shorts. We're going to a water park later. It'd be more efficient just to wear one outfit. And so she would probably shoot that down. The board shorts and the tank top would probably not go for this occasion. But when you spend time with someone, you become more like them. You learn from them. And so too, spend time with God. If you want to become more Christ-like, if you want your, your mind to be renewed, spend time with God in prayer. Ask him for wisdom. Ask to become more like him. Seek him out because Lord knows he's seeking after you. The second way you can identify uh, areas in your life that you need to defend when trouble comes, because it most certainly will come, is to seek wise counsel. Seek out wise counsel. We see this with Shema. There was a reason he was at that field of lentils. There was a reason he was there to defend it. It's because he had wise counsel and he was sent by King who? He's one of his mighty men. I can't hear you. David, very good. He was sent by King David. He was sent by King David to defend this field because it was God's will to defend that land. And the reason we know that is not just wise counsel, but Shema would also know that this field was even worth risking his life for because God had promised it to his people and the Philistines were trying to take it. They were trying to have the people of God serve them, the Philistines, and they were trying to maintain that land that God had promised to Israel instead of Israel having it. Look what it says in scripture that Shema would have known. He would have known this. Exodus 23, 31 says this, and I will set your border from the Red Sea to the sea of the Philo what? Philistines. Philo what? 
Yeah, I'll get y'all talking by the end of this, I promise. But the Philistines. And then we see again in Joshua 13, verses 1 through 2, again, it says this. This is God talking. He says, it says, well, it says, now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And so the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. Wow, way to put it on him, God. And there remains yet very much land to possess. This land that yet remains, all the regions of the who? The Philistines. Very good. The Philistines. So Shema knew that this land was promised to God's people. And because he knew this land was promised to God's people, and he had wise counsel that put him there, what did he do when the trouble came? He defended it. He knew beforehand. He knew before anyone was even there that he was going to defend it. If push came to shove, he was going to defend that land. And so I'd ask you this. Do you know what you would defend? Do you know where Satan might come and attack you in your life? Do you know those areas that you can surefire know that, that Satan will come to attack? Because we have them. I, I told the students not long ago, it was kind of grim, but it's what it is. We were talking about suffering. And, and honestly, for the students in the youth group, I want them to know that suffering will come. They need to know that. I, I don't want to have students from this youth group going out thinking that they're going to live their life, and as soon as suffering comes, and that means God's not real. That's not true. Guys, there will be suffering in this life. I don't care who you are. Suffering will come. It's not if, it's when. It's when. And it's hard and it's difficult. And we need to be there to pick those people up and encourage them during those times and pray for them during those times, lay hands on them during those times. But the suffering will come. There's no question. And so I want to give you a few areas to fortify, to seek after God's face, and to put in proactive measurements to be able to protect those areas, whatever what they might be. And here's a few of them. Here's number one. Caring for your family. Caring for your family. God will, or excuse me, Satan will attack your family. And you need God to protect your family. That is number one. Guys, in the United States, more and more often, homes are breaking in all kinds of different ways. And there are many who suffer that affliction. And, and, and for many, for have no fault of their own. But Satan will come to try and attack families, to break them up, to put them in difficult situations. And I cannot tell you the damage that it does. It, it's, it's, it's not quantifiable when, when Satan destroys a family. I, I remember I, I had one student a while back say this to me. I, I'll never forget it. It was, it was one of the gut, most gut-wrenching things I ever heard. I, I almost, uh, this is gross, so it's too much, but I, I almost felt like throwing up. It was one of those feelings where you have it in your stomach, you don't know what to do. And they told me, you know, one of my parents is in prison and the other one doesn't want me. So they said and, and they, they weren't embellishing. I found out later. They weren't because I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe that's not true. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe something bad happened. Maybe, maybe it's not that. That's what it was. That's what it was. And I know that's, that's a far off cry. You think, well, that'll never be me. That, I, I could never fall into that. I don't think anyone thinks they're going to fall into that. Guys, you have to protect your families. I had another kid tell me, and this is a, this is a while back too, but they said to me, I, I would do anything to have a father. We had someone talking about some dad issues they were having in their life. And I had one student come over to me and literally say, directly in my face, I don't know how to feel about hearing all this. I would do anything to have a father in my life. They said dad, anything to have a dad in my life. You know how hard that is to hear? It just, it, it hurts your stomach. It hurts you. The truth is, guys, Satan is scheming. Just as he was scheming to take that promised land away from the Israelites, He's scheming too to come into families. And you have to be protective of your family. You have to ask God to set a hedge of protection around them. You have to seek after ways to keep your family together. You have to be proactive about it. Do everything you can. And so too, we also see it even with discipleship in the home. Look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is from the Lord. He says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And this is what he tells parents to do with their kids. He says this, You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. For the parents that are here, and I'm a youth pastor, so yeah, I'm taking the time. And even for, if you're older, you have grandkids, great-grandkids, that's the same thing. You need to look out for them. I will tell you this. You have to be active about discipleship in your home. 
You can bring them to church. I can, I can work with your students. The other pastors can work with your students. But the reality is the primary disciple makers in a young man or a young woman's life is the parents. It's you guys. Whether you're a single parent, whether you're a foster parent, whether, whether you're an adopted, like whatever your situation might be. Families come in all shapes and sizes. Whatever your situation might be. You are the primary disciple maker. You are the, you are the main influence in your kid's life. You are number one. You're above even the coaches they look up to, the teachers they look up to, whoever it is your kid looks up to, the athletes, whatever. You are number one. They're watching you. You need to disciple them. And trust me, Satan does not want you to disciple your kids. Satan does not want you to be teaching your kids. Satan does not want you to be talking to them about the things of the Word. Satan, Satan does not want you to, to, to be walking with them and being with them when they rise and uh, being with them when they lay down. He doesn't want you posting Scripture on the, on the walls of your home. He doesn't want that to be a main element. And you need to fight against it. It's not a matter of if Satan's going to attack you in that area. That is one area that you will be attacked in. You have to be proactive and to defend. Just like Shema was at that lentil field. He knew he needed to defend that. Because God had promised it and it was going to be under attack. And he was there to defend it. So too, you need to be, under, you need to be on watch for your family. And be looking out for them. And be discipling them. One way you can do that, if, if you're interested, shameless plug here, we started doing something within the youth ministry where if you have a student between 6th and 12th grade, we actually have a small group every Sunday morning that meets from 9.45, really 10. We meet at 10. From 10 to uh, 10.45 on Sunday mornings. And we go over everything that we're going to teach on Wednesday night to your student so that you know ahead of time. So you know some of the discussions you can have with your students. So that you can prepare them a little bit more. So they're not just hearing it on Wednesday night, but rather we can partner together. Because guys, that, that's how church is supposed to work. We're partners, right? The, your partner's with the pastor. The pastor's partner with you. I'm here to serve you. That's what I'm here for. And I want to help you. Notice, I'm not here to do everything for your kid. And Dave, for your families, he's not here to do everything for you, right? You're led by God. You understand that? He is first. He is number one. And so if you're looking to, to build up that area of defense, that's one way to do it should you have kids. Let me give you another example of where Satan may come and try and, try and get you off course. That's in church, in ministry. You know, right now, we have a problem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a text message because I promised this person I would make an announcement today. So the nursery is one area where we need help. Flat out, straight up, it's, it's been tough for a long time. And we have, we have one person in particular that has been scrambling to make the nursery work for years. And they just need volunteers. They need volunteers. That's, that's what they need. They need faithful people to come and look after the kids. And, and even if that's not your area of giftedness, there is a huge need here. We could use your help. We're under attack in this area. Here's what the text message says. For the past few weeks, it's been really a struggle to get the nursery volunteers. And the only thing that saved us is the fact that we haven't been getting any babies. Well, how big of a bummer is that? What saved us is that we have less babies in church. I understand what she means. So many of my older teens are now working. She goes on a list, all these faithful people that have been there for literally years serving. So don't, don't look down on any of these people. They are godly, wonderful people. And I just lost this other person from a move and several others um, I, I've been having trouble getting a hold of. And there's another one um, who's not feeling well. And there's others who have sick parents that need to take care of their parents. And so they're missing more and more weeks because they have to take care of their parents, which they are right to do. So all these people are in the right, every single one of them. And they go on to say, it's come to the point where we need to make a plea to the congregation. Until then, I fear we will only be able to offer toddler supervision. And then she said, you have a Merry Christmas. Guys, we need help. That's one of the areas we need help in. If you want to be a part of defending the church here, if you want to be a part of partnering to raise up some of these young ones, we could use you in the nursery. We really could. If you're, if you're someone here and you're thinking, I wonder if the, if the Lord has a word for me today. I wonder if he has something for me maybe to go and do. That's one area where we really need your help. We could really, really use your help in the nursery, big time. I'm in the nursery once a month, or actually once every two months is what I am. Once every two months I'm in the nursery. I've never had a kid. I know very little about that. I've had to be trained by other parents on how to deal with this stuff. We need help. We need help. 
it's an area where right now we're under attack. And if we just had a few people that wanted to sign up to help every month or two, it would totally alleviate that. It would totally alleviate it. We need your help. And if we're going to be victorious, if we're going to minister to the kids that God brings to our church, then one of the things we need to do is we need to be willing to serve and to raise those kids up. Raise your hand if you've been here for a baby dedication. Anybody? Anybody been here for a baby dedication? Okay, that's a lot of people. You know, when we do those, we're making a promise. We're, we're telling the family that brings their kids up here, we're saying, we are going to help minister to your child. We are going to help to be there for them. So if God is calling you to serve in the nursery, just kidding. If God's calling you to serve in the nursery, we could certainly use your help. And there's many other areas, but that's the primary one right now that we need help in. Let me give you a few others. The church will always be under attack from Satan. It will always be a place that needs defense. A third one, or excuse me, a fourth one is the workplace. You have to look out for the workplace. Satan will attack you in the workplace. Affairs happen in the workplace. People slack off in the workplace. People sometimes use the workplace as an excuse to get away from their families. That happens too. Satan can attack in all kinds of different ways in the workplace. You have to be diligent about it. You have to pray for God to help you to navigate through some of those things. Because most people wind up in a workplace and you have to make sure that, number one, you're working heartily as unto the Lord, like Colossians 3 tells us. And at the same time, you also need to make sure that you're not neglecting your family. It's a hard balance to keep sometimes. Because some of us, we have to work hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And yet you need to maintain that family because what comes before work? Your what? Very good. Family. Exactly. Nice job. It's our family. And you guys are talking more and more, which I do appreciate. Look what the scripture says. It's what, it says, train up your child in the way that they... Oh, excuse me. It says, work heartily unto the Lord as not, as, as not for men. So you, you want to identify and be proactive in those areas. Now, on the flip side, not just identifying those areas, just like Shema identified that area. He was in the right place at the right time because someone was going to come intact and he was going to be there to defend it. Now the second part comes. And this is sometimes the harder part. It's easier to be proactive. It's easier to identify these areas. Here's the harder part. When that trouble does come, when that difficulty at work comes, when that difficulty at home comes, when that difficulty at church comes, and it seems like it's not possible to help in that area, it's not possible to defend in that area, it's not possible to add anything more than you're already doing in the home or in the workplace or wherever it might be, you have to stand. You have to stand. That's what, that's what Ephesians tells us. We have to stand. And that's even, that's even what Shema does. Look what it says. Look what it says that Shema does. After, it says, The Philistines had assembled in formation where there was a field full of lentils. And the troops did what, church? They fled. They ran like cowards. They ran from what they were called to do. They fled from the Philistines. But Shema, he took his what? He took his stand. He took his stand in the middle of the field, defended it, and struck down the Philistines. He took his stand. Listen to me here. If you are a Christian, you are called to boldness. If you are a Christian, you are called to have a backbone. That means when it comes to your family and protecting them and keeping, keeping them together and, and, and figuring out these difficult situations when your kids get into difficult times or all the kind of issues that can come up in the family, it's time to stand and do whatever work is necessary and trust God with that work. Because you're not going to win that day by the sweat of your brow or by the power of your back. You're going to win it by trusting in God and being empowered by Him. You're going to win it by entrusting your kids to the Lord and seeking His face and showing them how to seek His face and seek Him out in their quiet times, in their prayer, in the scripture. The Holy Spirit gives us boldness. Just look at Peter. Look at what Peter did. When you see him in the Gospels, it says, uh, Peter ran, Peter fled, Peter was afraid, Peter wept, Peter denied, Peter denied, Peter denied. And then, and then you see him in Acts. All of a sudden, something changes. He receives the Holy Spirit. He's emboldened, he's empowered. And then it says, Peter proclaimed. And he shared the gospel with 3,000 people. Even in the face of prison time, even in the face of death, Peter proclaimed. Peter shouted out the gospel. That's the boldness, that's the power that God gives us. So when I say take a stand against warfare, you can trust that that stand is empowered by God. 
That stand has nothing to do with you. It's all God. We're standing and God is the army. We're being faithful and God is the one who protects. God is the one who defends. God is the one who conquers. God is the one who gives the victory. I want you to see what it says in Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord. Who are we strengthened by? The Lord. So you're not strengthened by your power. You're not strengthened by how much you study the Bible. You're not strengthened by how much you pray. You're strengthened only and strictly by the Lord. That's it. And by His vast strength. That's who you're strengthened by. Same with Shema. Same with King David killing Goliath. It wasn't about David. It was about God. They were attacking God's people and God wasn't going to have it. And one person said, God will deliver me. God will deliver me. And Shema remembered the faithfulness of, of what God had done in the past when he stood up to the Philistines. What did everyone else do again when the Philistines came to that field? They did what? They fled. Like what? Cowards. Like cowards. They fled like cowards. But Shema took his stand. He took his stand partially because he knew what God had already done. Look what it says in Judges 3.31. Shamgar, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he saved Israel. There were 600 against him, and he killed them all. Then again, in Judges 13, we have someone named Samson. Samson's born, and he goes on to say, he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the who? The Phil who? The Philistines. And then we see again in Samuel 17, a little story you may have heard of, of David and Goliath. And this is literally what David says. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion. So who delivered him from the paw of the lion? The Lord. And also the bear. He will also deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And so Saul said to him, go and the Lord be with you. Not, oh, the armor be with you. Oh, your, your great plan of using the rocks be with you. Oh, your skill of throwing, throwing rocks at people. <laughs> it's not a good skill. <laughs> Don't throw rocks at people, church. All right? Unless they're nine feet tall and, they're trying, and they hate God, I guess. Anyways, the point is, is that you're empowered by the Lord. When it comes to taking a stand, you cannot be fearful. You can do it because don't fear the men you're standing up to, the people you're standing up to. Fear God. He's the one in control. He's the one that brings the might. He's the one that is going to sustain you. And so I'd ask you, church, are, are you standing? Are you standing in the stead with your family? Are you standing in the stead with your workplace? Are you standing in the stead in your church? Are you filling in the gap like Ezekiel says? Are you being faithful to those things. And I know there's no Philistines here, and we don't have to stand up to Philistines anymore, but I want to give you a few things you might want to look out for. A few things that you might have to stand up to, whether it be in your own life or it be in the life of another, perhaps one of your children or your grandchildren or one of your family. Here's a few of the things that plague the United States right now. I came up with a few of them, just three, and there's many more, but here's a few. One of the biggest dangers, I think, that I, this is one of my big prayer requests when it comes to the students. I pray that this not happen, that they avoid this. One of them is individualism. Yes, I want them to all be precious snowflakes. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that, all right? But what I do worry about is this mantra in our society that you just have to look out for number one, that you just need to, you know, do you, be true to yourself, follow your heart. I hear all this different stuff. And they, they, honestly, they sound good, don't they? They sound good. This is what we call worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. It sounds good. It even makes sense. If you don't look out for yourself, no one else will. But this is not godly. This is not godly. Godliness says to look after your neighbor. Godliness says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body and strength. It doesn't say look out for number one. It doesn't say that. In fact, when it comes to following your heart, the scripture actually teaches that, you know, the bad things that we do don't, don't actually, they're not influences on us, but rather they come out of our heart. They come out of our heart. Here's what Jesus says. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from where, church? With what? Within. Within. And they defile a person. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and above all things desperately sick. Who can understand it? Who can understand it? And then Romans goes on to tell us, No one is righteous, not even one. So when it comes to individualism, who do we lean on to guard us from that? 
Do we trust ourselves? Do we trust our heart? Do we trust our mind? No. We trust God. What is, what, essentially, what is being a Christian? It's following who? Following Christ, following Jesus. That's what being a Christian, a Christian is. Say it with me. Follow Jesus. That's it. It's not doing what you want, when you want, how you want, where you want. It's not about you. Being a Christian is following Jesus. Do you think that Shema thought, oh yeah, I want to fight hundreds of people today to defend a bean field. No. No, he didn't have like a hankering for, what was it, minstroni? I don't know how to say that word. I read it on the Progresso can, all right? He didn't, he didn't have a hankering for that. It wasn't about that. It was about being where God called him to do and defending that. And so guys, when individualism comes, when that, the sin of it, of worrying about only yourself comes, seek after God. Follow him. Open your word. It says in 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So we walk with God. And Romans 12, 1, 2 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Does that mean present your bodies as do whatever you want with it? No. It's a living sacrifice. And then he goes on to say, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Following God is your spiritual worship. Being a sacrifice to God, a fragrant offering to God, a, a cup being poured out to God is our act of worship. And it says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be like the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So I would say to you is, don't do you be doers of the word. Just like it says in James. Don't do you be doers of, your, of the word. Don't follow your heart. Follow Jesus. If you want to be someone that's going to stand against warfare, the way to do that is, is by following after God. By seeking him in the word. By looking after that. That's what Shema did. Shema knew what God's plan was there. He had had wise counsel from David, who he was submitted to under authority. And he also knew that he was protecting the promised land of God. He's protecting it. Here's another thing that you need to look out for. I know I'm running out of time here. Another one is this, busyness. Raise your hand if you struggle with busyness sometimes. You're so busy, you don't have time to do all sorts of different things you want to do. All y'all were like, what's he about to say? I'm going to put my hand down. I get that. And then I say, like, read the Bible. I'm like, oh, no, I do that. All right. Guys, busyness, I don't know about you, but I struggle with it. I struggle with it. There's a lot of things that I want to do that I feel like even God's called me to do that I find myself not doing. And I hate it. Raise your hand if you feel yourself in this situation sometimes. Am I the only one? Oh, good. Okay, there's others. So we're together in this mess. The, tr and the truth is, too, a lot of times I'll talk to students and I'll ask them, hey, have you been reading your Bible? You know, have you had time to do that? And then the number one answer they tell me is, I didn't have what, church? Time. I didn't have time. And then they hate it. I, honestly, any of them right now could recite to you exactly what I say to them because I kind of say the same thing every time. I'm a broken record if you didn't know that. I say this. I say, well, did you have time to eat? All those days? Did you have time for that? Okay, you did, didn't you? How many times? And for teenagers, it's like 10, all right, per day. So they have plenty of time to eat, right? Did you have time to go to the bathroom? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did that. So wait, when you had to go, you made it happen. Yes, I did, all right? I know that's crude, but it's the truth, all right? It's the truth. Did you, did you have time to, um, to, to, to watch YouTube? That's usually my go-to. Yes, I did. I'm a YouTube addict also. I'm the same way. It suggests a video to me. I, I click it and it's horrible. All right. Anyways, but we, we basically, we make time for what we want to have time for. My wife and I, we are 100% dork nerds. And every Thursday, we're watching Survivor on CBS.com and suffering through all their commercials because we like Survivor. We like that reality TV show. We make time for it because we want to do it. So when it comes to busyness, what I'd ask you is, are you making time for those things? Are you walking wisely in your time because the days are evil, as Ephesians 5 tells us? Are you making time for the things that God is calling you to? Are you making time for them? Because if you're not intentional about it, if you're not standing in that area, if you're not defending off the warfare that's coming at you in that area, you won't find time to do it. That is the truth. Your time will slip away in all kinds of different ways. If you're not being intentional, you'll lose that time and you'll lose out on what God's calling you to do. The third one, a third one is this, fear of man. This is one of the biggest ones. This is one of the biggest ones, fear of man. If you're looking for a way that you're going to potentially experience warfare and where you're going to have the opportunity to stand up, to have a backbone, to have a spine, to have boldness, look to fear of man. 
Because there's going to be a situation where you don't want to act a certain way. You don't want to say a certain thing. You don't want to stand up for a certain person. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be trying. And you need to be faithful to God when that time comes. Don't be like the other soldiers besides Shema that ran and fled and cowered. But stand. Put on the armor of God and stand. Pull out the sword of truth, or excuse me, sword of the Spirit and stand. Defend. Hold your ground when those things come. Recently we had, we had an issue with, uh, with some of the students. And I hate saying this, but it, it happened. You know, we, we've had some bullying going on. That's the worst. I hate bullying. I, I think everyone hates bullying. And that's, that's the sad part. That's even what I told some of the students. Because I don't know who did it. I just know the group. All right? And I, I even said to the group, I'm like, this is sad because even the world hates bullying. You don't have to be a Christian to hate bullying. Like, even the world knows this is horribly wrong. Everyone knows. And yet you're doing it. Why? And the truth is, for the bully, the bully knows it's wrong. So I didn't know who the bully was, so I spent my time addressing the other students, the ones who probably weren't bullying, but were there listening to it. Because a lot of times, what happens is, the bully is the only one that is really mean-spirited enough to say some of those things, and the rest of the people just don't really want to get in the way. They don't want to risk a friendship. They don't really maybe want to make fun of that kid, but hey, if that person's making fun of them, then you know, that's on them. And so then they just sit silently and watch it happen. Anyone ever seen something like this happen, whether you're in the situation or otherwise? All right, other, other people? All right, some of us? Guys, in that situation, what I told the students, as hard as it is to do, is you have to stand up for that defenseless person. You have to stand up. Stand up to the bully, even if they're not bullying you. Even if they're not coming after you. You have to stand up for them. Do you think that, Sh uh, that Shema was benefiting off the beans in that field? Probably not. Instead, he stood up because that was promised land of God. He stood up in a situation where he could have ran just like everybody else. So sometimes you're called to be the one person that's willing to stand up and be gentle about it and be godly about it, but you be firm about it. You stand up. You stand up to bullies. You stand up to difficult situations. You stand up when adversity comes your way. You stand up. You do the best you can with it. You stand it says in 1 Timothy 1.7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So be prepared when evil comes, because it will. And it doesn't always come in the form of a bully or in, in the form of an interpersonal issue. It could be something even worse. It could be cancer. There's people in this room right now that have been diagnosed with cancer in the past few months. They have to stand up to that. They have their whole family with them, and their family standing with them. And they're doing everything they can. And they're facing it right in the face. And they're still, not, they're still not advocating from their other duties. You know, I had someone recently, diagnosed with cancer, came to me and said, I want to serve. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's faithfulness. They came to me and they said, I want to serve. I want to help. And they were just diagnosed with cancer recently. I love that faith. That's such a great example. And the final point is this. Know that God brings the victory. The only reason you can stand up to warfare is because of God. The only reason you can identify what you need to defend is because of God. And last but not least, the only reason you can live victoriously is because of who? God. It's only because of God. That's all y'all. This is good. We're making progress. It, was, it is because of God. He's the only one. He is the one. He is the reason we win the day. It says, it says in Romans 8, right? If he's for us, then who could possibly be? against us who could be against us who could stand against the lord who could stand against the lord of hosts who could stand against the almighty god who could stand against yahweh who could stand against jesus our, our our savior and judge who could stand against him and we know it logically but sometimes it's so hard to live out and it's so hard to see it that way i want to read um a psalm to you verses three through eight it's it's of the uh it's psalm 44 and it's, it's of the people of God, and they're recalling all the things that God has done and all the ways that he's delivered them, even in the face of adversity when bad things were happening to them. And it says this in verses 3 through 8 of Psalm 44. For not by our own sword did we win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand. Whose right hand is that? God's. Very good. It's God's. Your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God. Ordain salvation for Jacob. 
Through, through you, we push down our foes. Through your name, we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes, and you have put to shame those who hate us. And God, we have boasted continually, continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. So church, I'll close with this. Whatever your struggle might be, the answer is not from within. It's not more this. It's not more that. First and foremost, seek after God. He's the strength. No matter how great your bow is, you could be Katniss, right? It's not going to be good enough. No matter how great your sword is, it's not going to be good enough. You need God. God is the one who fights your battles for you. God is the one who empowers you. It's his Holy Spirit that comes into you. It's his Holy Spirit that overwhelms you. It's his Holy Spirit that changes you. It's his Holy Spirit that even gives you the boldness to stand up in the first place. It's God. Submit to him and live a bold life. That's the irony. That's the irony. Is that, is that vi living victoriously, being bold, having a spine, having a backbone, it doesn't come by standing up and saying, oh, I'm so strong. It, it comes by submitting to God and trusting him with your life, trusting him with your actions. You see that, right? It comes from him, not you. It all comes from him. All of it. All of it comes from him.